First Corinthians 9, 24 says, that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, mm. so run that ye may obtain. Mm. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, well. but we an incorruptible. Mm. I therefore so run. Yes, sir. Not as uncertainly, so fight I. Mm. Not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body mm. and bring it into subjection, yeah. lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So, I just want to speak to you tonight surrounding the subject of run. Amen. And when I consider Paul, what he's writing here, Paul was giving his, you know, he was talking about how he was the apostle to them and he became a Jew to some. He became you know that scripture where he said, I, to the Jew who came out of Jew, that I might win. He was just going down the line of his course, really. Really just showing how he was the apostle to all that he encountered. But what really struck my attention was how he ends all that talking to say, in our natural, in a natural stance, when we watch people uh, in the tournaments, He's talking about the runner and he says that if you take note, there's no runner that you ever see quit. They might be in third place. They might be in fourth place. They might have started in first place, find a couple people past them. And you never see no runner say, oh, well, he got in first place, so I'm gonna just stop running. Every uh, runner continues to run until the, the race is over. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is naturally speaking. Mm -hmm. And I like what you said because you were in my thoughts a little bit. Because I was trying to figure out, well, we're not racing each other, so make it make sense for me real quick. But what he's talking about is we all have our courses in this, this race. We all have our separate courses, our separate lives. And all of us have a duty to run. Yeah. We have a duty to you know, take our course, finish our course. But let me backtrack a little bit. He says, the runner never stops, right? He keeps going because he has an objective in mind. He has in his mind to win the prize. Yeah. And so in order to win the prize, he has to continue. Yeah. And he says, so he says, that you may obtain. Yeah. So he's making a picture of the natural thing with our spiritual walk with Christ. Amen. And so he goes on and says that every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Look at that, that definition. It talks about how it's self-control. It's the exhibit of self-government conduct. Mm -hmm. And so in the figure of the athlete, it's really talking about how he prepares himself for the tournament. Long before he races, long before the actual day of tournaments, he has been preparing himself. Some people, they they don't drink anything that's sugary, you know, yeah. they abstain from uh, bad drinks, they abstain from fatty foods. Yeah. Even have some people who say how they abstain from sexual indulgence yeah. because it builds up a bunch of testosterone and it helps them to be successful mm -hmm. in their bout. Yeah. Excuse me. So, I just want to lay that because Paul is talking about, I want you to see how it parallels. You see a similarity in your spiritual walk with Christ. Yeah. We're in this race, we're striving but we need to be sure that we don't quit. We need to be sure and understand that this is not a race that you can quit and still get the prize. 
This is a race of endurance. This is a race that causes for stamina and, you know, perseverance. And so he says he's temperate in all things. Their crown is corruptible, but ours is incorruptible. He says, I therefore so run. Paul is saying, I have my own course I'm running. I'm running and I'm not uncertain. I don't lack confidence. I don't lack a sense of direction. I, I know where I'm going. I know what I have in mind. And he says, so fight I. When I see that, I see that his uncertainty, the lack of uncertainty means he understands that he must fight. Yeah. He recognizes that he's not going to just come through here because he desires to. He's Letting us know that there's a war in his members as well as ours. The flesh wrestling against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. They both cannot coexist. They both cannot have the preeminence in our lives. One trumps the other. And I notice that the flesh never dies, but its influence, its ability to control you or to die, its ability to Rain in your life ought to die. The spirit ought to be alive and well yeah. and directing and leading and guiding us. Yeah. And as I begin to keep reading, I notice in the 10th chapter, he begins to give an example of the children of Israel, how God richly blessed them. He said that they were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all passed as they drank the spiritual drink. They had that spiritual meat. God had richly blessed them. God called them out. God had picked them. God graced them. God put his love upon them. Not for any significance of their own, but because he just chose them from the foundation of the world. And he's given this as an example, he tells us. We ought to learn from their example. They're written for us to give an admonishment that just as God has richly blessed them, God has done the same for us. God has called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. God has predestinated us to be conformed to his image. God has allowed the wars of baptism to remove the sin out of our lives. Then he allowed his spirit to be in us, filling us up with the Holy Ghost. Let his spirit break the yoke of sin. Let him allow his spirit to lead us and guide us into a whole nother kingdom. And so we're richly blessed on tonight, yes, thank you. We are called out of darkness yeah. into this marvelous light. Yeah. We are privileged people. Thank you, oh, we are, God's grace is shining upon us. Yeah. We are so blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. God's saying, we have my, you have my word, you have everything from me. But I want you to remember that there is a race you must run. Mm. And there are obstacles. This flesh being one of the main ones. And so he begins to keep on writing. He says, it's for our example. We are blessed by God. He is shining upon them. But we should take a look at their behavior. We should consider how God was leading them to the land of promise. God had a, I mean, he had a plan for their lives. He had it all mapped out. If they would but follow him and be obedient. Yeah. If they would but deny their selfish will. Yeah. If they would but solely depend upon him. He would eventually bring them to a land that was flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. He would bring them to a land that he would subdue the inhabitants in their sight. He would fight for them. He would protect them. He would give them everything that they needed. When we look at their lives, we watch the stories as we read in the Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and all that. Them folk murmur constantly, complain. See, these are the obstacles to the race that we're running. If we don't get a hold of our flesh, we don't get a hold of our attitudes, we want to find ourselves overthrown in the wilderness. But God is saying, I've 
yourself. It means to give your whole self over to complete this day. God said you got the power to win. And so, hallelujah. We got to look at this list. And now we got to begin to examine ourselves. We got to begin to see that the way God responded to these behaviors. He was not pleased with it. And he said, if you can't be idolaters, you can't be fornicating, mm -hmm. you can't be tempting him, you can't be murmuring, yeah. complaining. That's right. And these were our examples. Yeah. And so God said, examine yourself now. These things that Paul listed, they're great hindrances to your victory. Yeah. I want you to be successful. I brought you here so that you can be successful. But now it's time to make a choice. Now it's time to be determined. It's time to put up a fight against the very thing that's fighting you. I, I want you to run. I want you to put everything that you have into making this eternal salvation. Yes. And so he reminds me. Paul was saying, I haven't apprehended for what I've been apprehended of. I I'm not there yet. I'm a powerful man of God. I'm used mightily. I surrender my will to him. But there's still a war as long as I live. And I'm going to press towards the mark. I'm pressing towards the image of Jesus Christ. There's nothing else I want to be like. I want to be like him. The one that called me. The one that loves me. The one that's working with me. The one that's dealing with me. I'm, I'm pressing to be like him. Because that's the main goal, saints. That's what it's all about. To be like Jesus. And I know it seems cliche because it's more than just, you know, looking good and looking nice. We have to bear his sufferings. You know, we have to turn the other cheek. You talk about being like Jesus. We have to forgive and mean it from our hearts. Oh, not holding grudges and, you know, you know, keeping offenses against one another. Looking at one another sideways when we do things. I don't even know what I'm talking about right now, but I'm just going with you, Lord. Because God wants us to be saved. God wants us to understand that. I want you to be saved all the time more than you want to be saved. Because we want it our way sometimes. We want it to be on our terms sometimes. But I heard him say, if you want to come after me, deny yourself. Take the Jesus is coming! Jesus is coming! We got to 
situation, it feels like you're going to be swallowed up. It feels like you don't have the strength to stay up for another minute. But God said, I'm greater. I'm the power. Tap into me. Don't give up. But I want you to know it's an urgency, y'all. Yes. God, these things are coming down the pipe. Things are happening. Yeah. We're going to see some things. Yeah. We heard it for many years. But we're that much closer. God said, strip yourself. Get clean in my sight. I'm gonna do something in your hands, but please. 